In today's lecture, I'm going to continue to describe some of the chemistry that is unique to the alpha position of aldehydes, ketones, esters, etc. Before we get into new material, let's pause for a second and review the previous lecture's material. This review quiz asks you to name the product of this reaction. Go ahead and pause the video for a minute and try to come up with this on your own. Okay, now let's see how you did. This is a beta keto ester. So here's the ester functional group right there, and there's the ketone at the beta position. We are treating this with a base. This is a reaction taken from the literature through SciFinder Scholar, and they have a tendency to designate R as a reactant, and S is the solvent. And DMF is a standard organic solvent, stands for dimethylformamide. This is just a catalytic base, and its job is to deprotonate the beta keto ester. Once we've enolyzed the beta keto ester through deprotonation, then we will alkylate it with the alkyl halide. So, in the last lecture, we discussed the EASD process enolization, alkylation, saponification, decarboxylation. This reaction doesn't show an acidic workup, so we're just going to go through the enolization and the alkylation. The enolization involves the carbonate ion removing a hydrogen from the alpha position, and those electrons slide up onto one of the two carbonyl groups. Technically, it doesn't really matter which of the two carbonyl groups you push those electrons to because they're just resonance structures of each other, but the ester does stabilize this carbonyl group more than this ketone is stabilized by the phenyl group. So it is more likely that the enolate will form on this side. But again, kind of a trivial detail when you take into account we're just arguing which resonance structure to show as an intermediate. In any event, this is the enolization step. Once the enolate has been loaded, now we have the alkylation step. The electrons drop down and go out and push into the alkyl halide and bump that off and we have an alkylated beta keto ester at the alpha position. If this had been the previous lecture, then we would go on to talk about the saponification, where we convert this ester into a carboxylic acid, and then the decarboxylation, where after acidic workup, we cook this off just to end up with our ketone and an alkyl group at the alpha position. Naming the product is not easy. There's a lot going on here. Um, of all the functional groups that we have, this ester right here is the highest priority functional group. And so that's going to dictate the parent chain and the number one carbon. Extending out from the ester, we have one, two, three carbons if we go this way, or one, two, three carbons if we go that way. When you have two parent chains of equal length, you choose the parent chain that has the most substituents coming off of it. This parent chain cutting horizontally has an oxo group, a phenyl group, and a hydroxy benzyl group coming off of it. If we cut down, then this is just a single group, and then this becomes a single group as well. So this parent chain would only produce two substituents, and the parent chain here would produce three substituents, so we choose this as our parent chain. So the three things coming off of this, at the three position we have an oxo group, at the three position we also have a phenyl group, and at the two position, we have a benzyl group that also has its own substituent, a hydroxy group, at the three position of the benzyl. So this is going to be in parentheses. We alphabetize everything, so the hydroxy, and then the oxo, and then the phenyl, put in the appropriate numbers, the punctuation, the parentheses, and then all the way out in front, we tack the name of the alkyl group that's hanging off of the other side of the ester. Okay. On to new material. Today's lecture will focus on five different topics. And the first of these topics is halogenation of the alpha carbon. To set the groundwork for halogenating the alpha carbon, we need to consider the two conditions where we can form an enolate or an enol. And those are either base catalyzed conditions or acid catalyzed conditions. And the base catalyzed conditions is what we've spent most of our time thinking about up until now. And this is easy to push the equilibrium towards the products because it's an acid-base reaction. 
This acid has a pKa of 18 to 20. That's common for most aldehydes and ketones. And as long as we use a base that produces a conjugate acid that is weaker than the aldehyde or ketone acid, then we can drive equilibrium towards the formation of the weaker acid. And so as long as we use a strong enough base, well, which bases are strong enough? And the answer is mostly the amide bases work really well. A lithium diisopropyl amide is appropriately sterically hindered and does a great job. In a pinch, we're using alkoxide bases and they don't tend to favor the product at equilibrium, but they produce enough for us to go ahead and do the rest of the chemistry. Alternately, under acid catalyzed conditions, we can convert the ketone to an enol. And the enol is capable of a lot of the same chemistry that the enolate can do, only the enol is harder to produce. For this acid catalyzed reaction involving acetone, the equilibrium, in other words, shifting it from reactant to product, has a constant of 6 times 10 to the negative ninth. Meaning that for every one of these that you end up with, you have approximately a billion of these that haven't reacted to form the enol. So equilibrium does not favor typically the formation of the enol under acid catalyzed conditions. This creates a problem. And so this then becomes the rate determining step in any reaction where we need an enol because it's so difficult to get the enol to form. There are a couple of exceptions to this. One is anytime you have a beta carbonyl group, then enolization will produce a hydrogen that can bridge across both carbonyl groups to form a pseudo six-membered ring that's bridged together by hydrogen bonds. And the equilibrium constant for this reaction still doesn't favor the enol in this particular case, but it's a lot closer. Uh, we have an equilibrium constant of 0.2, which means you get about one of these for every five of these or so. Uh, an extreme example is the case of phenol, which is a benzene derivative that is common enough that hopefully you're familiar with that name. And that's the term enol shows up right in the name, and that's because the equilibrium constant overwhelmingly favors the tautomer form of the enol versus the ketone. And this has an equilibrium constant of 10 to the 13th. It's essentially loaded entirely on this side because of aromatic stabilization. These two are rare. The more common example is that we have just a regular aldehyde or ketone and we need it to enolize and then once it does, and this is very slow, does not produce a high yield of enol content, then it can attack an electrophile. A base removes the hydrogen and we are able to do chemistry at the alpha position. The specific reaction that takes advantage of this enol content to put something interesting at the alpha position is halogenation of an enol. And so once we form the enol, which is the rate determining step, then the enol can unload into a molecular halogen. The halogen then deprotonates the carbonyl oxygen and we end up with an, a halo alpha substituted ketone or aldehyde. And this acid that's produced in this reaction then catalyzes the conversion of subsequent ketones or aldehydes over to the enol form. So this is called an autocatalytic reaction where the reaction generates its own catalyst. And this works well enough. You can put halogens at the alpha position of a ketone or an aldehyde under acidic conditions. And the question then, what else can we do besides just putting halogens at the alpha position or an aldehyde or a ketone? What about carboxylic acids? Well, carboxylic acids can tautomerize. So if you just kind of ignore this OH group and just focus on the carbonyl and the alpha position, this looks a lot like an aldehyde. And so just like an aldehyde or a ketone, a carboxylic acid can tautomerize to produce a carboxylic acid enol. Only this has an equilibrium that's even less favorable. So it works a little bit. And even though it doesn't produce a lot of enol content, the whole point is that if the enol can now unload through the alpha position, that means we can harness the carboxylic acid to do some chemistry at the alpha position. And the one notable example of this is the hell volhard solinsky reaction. And the mechanism for this one is fantastic, but 
not something that can even fit on a single slide. So we're going to let this one go and not worry about the mechanism. The chemistry is that using PCL3 as a catalyst and any molecular halogen, Br2, Cl2, I2, you can halogenate the alpha position while leaving the carboxylic acid alone. So this is a functional group multiplier. We leverage an existing functional group to put another functional group next to it. And those are useful reactions in organic synthesis because you don't have to spend a functional group to add a new functional group on there. You get to keep both of them. The purpose of doing this, what's the point, is now we have a leaving group right next to the carboxylic acid. And so when you attack it with a nucleophile, now you can exchange out the halogen with whatever nucleophile your synthesis calls for. And this gives you some flexibility to do different types of syntheses. Unfortunately, we teach you kind of these basic principles in uh, general organic chemistry, and then we send you off to graduate school to learn more, but by that time you tend to forget. One of the key uses of the hell volhard zelensky reaction is the synthesis of amino acids. If this nucleophile is ammonia, then we can plug that in and bump off the bromide, and we have the amino group, the alpha carbon, and the carboxylic acid with a variety of different R groups that could be different amino acids. Second topic. In a previous lecture, I talked about how a base could deprotonate the alpha position to produce the enolate, and then that enolate would unload into an electrophile. We used alkyl halides as that electrophile, and now we're going to look at using molecular halogens as that electrophile. In the presence of a base, we form the enolate. The enolate then attacks your molecular halogen, and we now have an alpha halo aldehyde or ketone. And this is the same product that you would get if you did it under acidic conditions as well. The basic conditions are faster, but you present a problem. This hydrogen right here has a pKa in the ballpark on an aldehyde of 15 to 17. Once you put the first halogen on there, then the remaining hydrogens now have an even lower pKa because the electron withdrawing nature of the halogen will enable this hydrogen to leave more readily. It was more acidic, lower pKa. And that means that the hydroxide is going to start to pluck off that hydrogen at a higher rate than it plucks off that hydrogen. And the result is you end up with three halogens at the alpha position. So this black diagram right here represents the mechanism I showed you on the previous slide. And the blue diagram shows the second halogenation step. And the steps are the same. You formation of the enolate, and then the enolate unloads into a molecular halogen. And then your third step is the hydroxide again. Hits that last hydrogen to form the enolate, and the enolate unloads into a molecular halogen. So same mechanism three times, and ultimately we end up with three halogens at the alpha position. And this is hard to control, and it's not done yet. The final step of this reaction occurs when the hydroxide, now out of alpha hydrogens to rip off, then comes along and attacks the carbonyl carbon. Electrons cycle up onto the oxygen. Then they cycle down and they knock off this trihalo methyl group. And this doesn't normally seem like a good leaving group. You don't generally bounce carbons off as leaving groups. But this particular carbon has three halogens which can share that negative charge so this is a good enough leaving group that it comes off almost on its way out the door. Probably immediately it rips the hydrogen off of the carboxylic acid that we form, and we end up producing a haliform and a carboxylate. This reaction from start to finish is called the haliform reaction, and it's a useful way of converting an aldehyde or a ketone to a carboxylate and generating an equivalent of haliform. Haliforms are chloroform, bromoform, iotoform, and they have their own uses, but it's generally the carboxylate that we want. And you have to protonate this to get back to the carboxylic acid, so there would be an acidic workup step.